Ben Myers, great to have you on. Thank you for taking the time. Hey, Miles, great to be here. Thanks. So um, you are a, a, um, a absolute uh, outperforming uh, C-suite executive, um, both in the CFO role and COO role. Uh, you go, uh, you've worked at Google and just about uh, th 13 other uh, um, startups and, and exciting companies and roles. Um, so, so it's great to have you here. And I know you'll bring a lot of value to the startups that we have on the platform. Um, I'd like to just kind of start with, um, maybe you can just kind of introduce, um, yourself and, and kind of where, where you see yourself playing into the startup ecosystem. And then maybe we'll get into some of your uh, work history. And I'd love to, you know, talk about the experience at Google as well. Sure. Yeah. I'd love to, um, just at a high level, I, I worked in venture capital for, I think about seven years uh, before uh, basically starting what was an internet accelerator uh, with some venture-backed funding. Uh, we started in Brazil, and then we launched a couple of companies in Brazil that expanded out of Brazil. And that took about, from start to finish, about 12 years. Uh, and now I'm doing uh, part-time fractional work as CFO, COO, uh, consulting for companies. Amazing. Um, well, I'd love to learn about your venture experience, especially in Brazil. I think there's, um, you know, we've met a number of extremely impressive founders out of Brazil. And I think um, with, you know, language barriers and just the, the, the way that the scene developed in Silicon Valley um, and in and, uh, certain other like metropolitan areas in the U.S., there's so much talent that's being overlooked and so many opportunities that are being overlooked. Maybe we can just take a minute and speak to that. Like, what I, I know you're fluent in Portuguese. You ran this um, accelerator out of Brazil. Maybe you can give a shout out to the kind of Brazil startup ecosystem here. I, I think the Brazil startup e ecosystem has evolved enormously over the past 10, 12 plus years. When we started our accelerator and we were we had started the planning in 2009, basically, you could see that Brazil was on the cusp of just an explosion of internet and app usage. And there weren't a lot of companies who were ready to tap it. And so that's what we saw as our opportunity to bring those kind of companies into Brazil. What happened in the subsequent years is that there was so much local innovation, uh, either people looking at models that had worked elsewhere and bringing them into Brazil or creating Brazil only models from scratch, that the ecosystem went very rapidly from like one or two or three venture funds supporting the whole country to, you know, 10 times that, and then all this international interest. Uh, so the trajectory has been great. And, and the Brazilian entrepreneurial spirit um, is very energetic. Awesome. Um, so, uh, and you mentioned you were running an accelerator. Obviously there's some overlap with what we're doing at Arcanium. We're not technically an accelerator, but we offer a lot of the same services. So I'm just curious, maybe you can speak a little bit to your experience in venture and, and what it was like to, um, to be involved at the accelerator. Yeah, I mean, for us, an accelerator was basically us trying to find successful business models, bring them into Brazil, either through a partnership or investment and creating companies together or trying to replicate models that had been successful. Um, and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work. That's the nature of the game. Uh, for example, the very popular dating app, uh, who I won't mention by name, that we thought, gee, that's a cool model. Maybe that'll work in Brazil and tried to build our own. It didn't work. Uh, on the other hand, one of the companies that we partnered with was a very successful international security company, uh, security and privacy that had started in the consumer app space. And for us, that became our, our biggest business and, and one of our most successful businesses. Um, so I, I think uh, it was more of a hands-on let's build it, let's get in there, put executives in, take the executive roles ourselves uh, and try to scale these companies very hands-on, uh, which you that. don't always see as accelerators. Oh yeah, definitely not. And I've participated in a few pretty name brand accelerators in my career. And I can tell you, you definitely do not experience that necessarily. And it's part of why we were doing what we're doing at Arcanium was like, um, hey, these startups still need a lot of hands-on help, and um, let's let's create an ecosystem where that's more available. Um, I also want to shout out or just point out and and kind of commend you for mentioning a failure because I've had a lot of these conversations, and I can tell you that's basically the first time I've heard it is someone really <laughs> just 
opening up and saying like, Hey, you know, we tried this, it didn't work. And then we tried this other thing and it was awesome. And I think that's, um, it's so such an integral part of the startup ethos that, um, you know, so we're often selling ourselves and selling our startups. We forget to be humble. So I, I really appreciate you pointing that out. Yeah, look, um, I don't think anybody goes into this wanting to fail, but the nature of the venture business is such, right? Everybody who's in venture knows that's the nature of the business. And you do the best you can, and you think you've got an idea that's really going to make it. But sometimes, for whatever reason, uh, it doesn't. And, you know, more often than not, I think that's the state of many venture-backed companies. Yeah, so... Um... And maybe this will tie into your kind of CFO role. I, I understand that your consulting is a, a little bit unique on the COO side, or at least specialized, where you say um, you really take a deep look at financials and you're, you, you really bridge the gap between operations and financials. So I'm going to ask the question, but it's, it's, a, it's a tee up for kind of talking about the CFO side. Um, you know, how, how do you know that that project was going to fail and when to shut it down and um you know how does that kind of play into your your vision of looking at financials and operations today yeah you know there's a lot of talk these days about the default alive default dead scenario and i think you know you need to be honest with yourself and with your co-founders and with your board about where you fall on that scale and if you think you're in the default dead category what can you reasonably do to get out of it you know funding is not what it was even a couple of years ago and there's a lot more emphasis on um, strong financials uh, and EBITDA being positive as quickly as it can be and trying to self-fund as much as you can. Uh, and I think it's important to have honest conversations about that. Uh, like all entrepreneurs, you'll, you'll keep going and you know, throwing yourself into the, into the wall until you break through it. But at some point, if the numbers don't align, you need to think about the employees and the investors and how to potentially you know, think about shutting down or exiting the business, um, which yeah. isn't always just closing the doors and going home, right? There's a lot of things you can do to sell the business, to find a partner, to, to do an M&A, um, but it's, it's definitely become much more realistic these days. Absolutely. And, and um, I, I, I appreciate that honesty is kind of a cornerstone. I've seen you um, say that word a lot. It seems like it's a very important uh, value to, to your practice. Um, and and kind of a sober look at these financials and, and really kind of planning how to make the next steps to, to, to save or improve the business. Uh, and we saw venture capital take like a huge, a huge dive um, and just a lot of changing. So like, um, yeah, the, the kind of major economic cycle happening at the very soon after um, the crypto freeze um, where we had a whipsaw in that market. And then you have chat GPT coming out and a lot of hype on that side around AI. Um, I've, I've heard some venture capitalists saying, hey, we're warming up to, to, to putting more money into startups again. Um, I think we are on a trend of bigger and bigger checks at the early rounds. And then 22, 2022, uh, 2023, seeing Series C and D really dry up. Um, and then uh, I've heard other people saying, actually, get ready because the check sizes are going to get smaller because AI is going to push people to do more with less. Um, so I'm curious, you know, for the startups out there, like how should they be thinking about financials? Are we still in a time where you should be um, just really careful and have a really long runway? Should we start to open up again, like kind of pre um, dip times or, or I don't know what, what, what's, is there any kind of general guideline you can prescribe there? Is it more individualized? Generally, I, I think my guidance, whether you're talking about an exit or you're talking about a funding round, if there's appetite for one, my, my guidance generally is take the money. Um, yeah. I've, seen, I've seen too many other sides of that coin where people don't take the money and then they regret it. I, I think getting more runway, giving yourself and your team more confidence that you have more time to execute, assuming that you can do it at a price that's reasonable, a price that you think is fair is the thing to do. I mean, the, the whole uh, recent situation in the banking sector with the collapse of SVB and the you know, teetering on the brink of some of the other banks that are still in discussion has, I think, made private credit, venture debt even more difficult to get, bank-based credit. Uh, I think you're going to see a tougher time still in the, in the next six to 12 months because of those factors. And so if you have visibility to a financing hour, you think you have some way to get some extra funds in the door, 
that'll buy you some extra time to weather the storm and to execute on your plan, generally, if the price is right, take take the money. Yeah, I think that's sage advice. Um, so, so now I want to go way back because um, looking into your history, I saw a, a pretty interesting uh, and, and exciting fact. Um, you were the first MBA intern uh, okay. at Google back in the year 2000. So, I mean, yes. that's, that's a pretty cool claim to fame. Um, just curious, you know, obviously that was almost 20 years ago, um, but I More than 20 back. years ago. So, yeah, <laughs> 23 years ago. I mean, it's so interesting and so cool. Uh, maybe you can speak to that time and, and tell me how the Google ecosystem inspired, inspired you. Yeah, you know, it's funny when I, when I think about it now, like the behaviors that were going on remind me of a lot of very, very early stage startups that I see today. When I was at Google back then, I think it had about 110, 120 people tops, maybe even 100 people. Yeah. And there, there was still shenanigans going on. When I, when I got there, they had had some sort of outdoor picnic. And at the picnic, there was a big uh, ice cream freezer that was stocked with like either, you know, dryers or Ben and Jerry's or, or some gourmet brands of ice cream. And a bunch of the engineers just decided that they would pick up the cooler and put it back in their office. And then the company <laughs> was, was restocking it every day, uh, you know, and uh, it was the kind of place where you would come in in the morning and, and Sergey would be playing Mortal Kombat with some of the other devs. Like it was a, it was a different time and place, but the company had a very, very focused mission. They had already started uh, doing advertising sales. They were aggressively moving into business development sales. Uh, and it was a great place to be. It just sort of opened my eyes of the prospects and possibilities of working at a startup. If I had to pick one time to work at Google, that might be it. You know, I mean, just because, you know, they're knowing what we know now, of course, they're going to be this mega, mega corp um, and just to see how they got there early on must have been pretty special. Yeah, it was it was a fascinating place. And sometimes I, I look back and I, I see the people who I worked with who are still at Google in various roles and just how they've evolved and grown and everything they've been doing since then. It's fascinating. So let's talk about some of the more recent um, gigs. I know uh, I see Tokenology Labs, um, but certainly a bunch of others that you're um, advising at or working at in parallel. Um, I don't know if you can talk about any of those projects or how NDA they are, but may, maybe you can just speak to um, like kind of the different verticals and sectors you're interested in. And maybe with some case study or examples would be amazing. Sure. Um, we, I have a lot of experience hands on with a couple different sectors. So our primary company uh, was in the privacy and security space. We started off on the consumer side uh, with antivirus, anti-hacking, anti-malware for consumers for smartphones for iPhones, for Android phones. And then we moved into doing B2B SaaS and actually trying to address what we saw as a pretty big need on small and medium sized businesses for the type of security that generally is only bought by bigger companies. Uh, and so we, we constructed a SaaS practice uh, out of you know, our consumer business, which was interesting. I think the, the leverage point for us there was 99 plus percent of the attacks that get into companies are the same attacks that get consumers. In fact, most of the ways that hackers or malware gets into companies these days is through the employee's own device, the employee's own smartphone. So it was a, an interesting segue for us. Um, I also worked on an online ed tech company uh, called Passe Giretto that built a really active and uh, productive community for Brazilian, initially Brazilian university students and then expanded into both sides of that, the high school side and the, the postgraduate side. Uh, and they were sold to a big online media company in, in Brazil. Uh, so I, I enjoyed oh, the ed tech space as well. Yeah, thanks. And um, the tokenology uh, opportunity is, is really interesting because with the demand for blockchain no, not really showing signs of slowing down, even with the, the challenges, I think the crypto market in itself, the, the sort of applications of blockchain for real products and real services uh, is going to demand enterprise level, enterprise scale tokenization, right? The ability to tokenize things into the blockchain at scale, at a low cost, with a lot of security. And uh, that's the space that technology is focused on today. I couldn't agree more. I mean, um, yeah, it's, 
I love that um, blockchain captured the um, the average person's curiosity and excitement and became that first, you know, kind of the massive boom that I think did push the industry forward in the end, just because it brought a ton of venture funding and, and a ton of uh, innovators and engineers got excited about it. Um, but as we see it, we saw it kind of crash on the NFT side. You're absolutely right. There's so many applications for um, it's just a new type of computing, decentralized compute. And, um, and it's very exciting. Uh, beyond that, my personal interest uh, is is non-tech. So I have a lot of interest in wine and spirits and beer. I used to work at a winery. I used to work at some craft breweries. Uh, I actually wrote two books on craft beer uh, back when, when craft no beer was way. just starting in the U.S., and uh, I think to the extent there's any interesting opportunities in those spaces, I'm always I'm always looking. Man, I am so glad that you said that because, um, you know, it seems like, OK, just throwing it out there. But I literally talked to a founder yesterday who's working on a blockchain app whose real goal in life is to open a microbrewery. <laughs> so I, and I've had his beer and it's phenomenal. So I'm going to make an intro to you. And at the very least, I hope he sends you a bottle because it's awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, across blockchain um, uh, and all these different uh, use cases um, and, and certainly micro brews, which are probably becoming more and more technical as well. Um, yeah. What's the ideal kind of company size for you to work with? You know, what would be the best intro um, uh, we can make or if, if a company, a startup founder is watching this? You know, what would you tell them to say to, for them to know whether it's a good fit to reach out to you? I, I think I'm, I've generally found that I'm really most effective sort of series A to series D or C to series D. That's the place where you can come in and really help a company start to get financial and operational side of the house in order alongside the development of the product, alongside the goal to go to market, alongside the construction of a sales team. There's a lot of stuff that if you don't start to do it at that stage, it becomes really much harder to go back and do it later. In fact, some of the experiences I've had, I've had to go in and clean up companies three years on, you know, that didn't mm. have any financial controls, that didn't have any financial tools, that didn't have any kind of uh, in-house accounting or in-house accounting software, FP&A tools, uh, way to manage their documents were, you know, counting on just 100% outsourced um, financial help or outsource legal help. And you can do it. We've, we've cleaned up situations like that, me and my team in, you know, 90 days, but uh, it's better to do it early on. And I like operating in that space. I think there's a lot of instant productivity and instant results you can bring with some very basic tools. One of the big topics recently that, that everybody was talking about was, gee, what kind of uh, bank account and treasury structure do I need to have, right? Yeah. You've gone from a world where everyone was just taking whatever money they had and keeping it in SVB to imminent panic that it was all gone. And I think that forced a lot of earlier stage companies to say, gosh, I better have a treasury strategy and I better know like the cash that I need in the next six months, where am I parking it? The cash that I need six to 12 months, where am I going to park that? Now that I can get yields again, if I don't need you know, some of this cash for more than a year, where do I park that? And how, how many bank accounts should I have with what kind of banks? Um, so I think there's a lot of operational financial uh, practices that have kind of come back into vogue due to the new environment. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it makes me think, um, and I'm, I, this is not really my expertise, this space, but I feel like some kind of one click load balancer, you know, like that's what we really want, right? Is like if I go over 250, make sure the other 250 is in a different account because we don't necessarily want to rely on this anymore. Yeah. Um, and, and, and sadly, it's not that automated yet. And, oh, no, it's not. Yeah. It's so much work. I mean, this is like a lot of work for, for an early founder to go around and call banks and set up accounts and move money around manually. So, absolutely. Um, excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, I look forward to where I, that last thing you said. I mean, we could spend another hour on that. I know you've got to go to another call. Um, so I'll let you go, but I would love to meet up again, dig into like, Hey, you know, when you're at that, this seed or series a stage, which, you know, our game also happens to be at, um, you know, what are, what is the right stack for, for finance and what is the right stack for operations for each use case? 
Um, and, and like how advanced should those models be and should we be outsourcing? I mean, I can tell you right now, almost every founder I know at this stage is, uh, is doing exactly what you warned against, which is outsourcing <laughs> most of that and not building it up the capabilities internally. I know some series A companies that are maybe a little more advanced, but I can tell you there's a huge need there. So, um, so yeah, it's, a, it's look, it's a great topic. And, and just to give a shout out, one of the groups, uh, professional organizations that I participate in called the Operators Guild, which is composed of CFOs and COOs and founders has spent a lot of time looking at the space and even does some angel investing into companies that we think will be part of the next finance stack, the next, the next, you know, generation HR stacks, uh, and have had some really interesting companies pop up to fill those, uh, kind of slots in whatever company needs to put in. So whether you're talking about fp and tools, whether you're talking about job description writing tools, candidate screening tools, uh, even things like usage-based billing. We've had a lot of discussions and a lot of kind of good practices that we've developed around it that I'd be, I'd be happy to talk about at some point. Yeah, that'd be amazing. And maybe even in, an intro to them, it sounds like they're pretty relevant um, for what we're doing as well with building this kind of startup ecosystem. Um, so with that, uh, I'll let you go. Um, and thank you again for your time. So great. Yeah, awesome. Talk. Thanks, Miles. Great talking with you. Ciao.